Welcome back, everybody, to your daily update. <clears throat> well, sort of daily, all the children have the state of the Malazan Empire. And today we're back where I said we would be yesterday. Um, that is, we're starting to talk about Stone Wielder, the third novel of the Malazan Empire, written by Ian Cameron Esselmont. Um, and kind of continuing where um, Return of the Crimson Guard left off. Um, now, I've read this one before, uh, <laughs> but I, like, what I can already tell from, like, just having read the first two chapters and, of course, the prologue, this is probably the one I've forgotten the most parts of. So, <laughs> this is, while not a <laughs> first read, is certainly <laughs> a reread that feels a lot like a first read because I barely remember stuff in, here, stuff in here, which, you know, tells you a lot about this is my state of mind when I first read it, I assume. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where we are right now. So we're going to start to talk about Stone Wielder today. Prologue, chapters 1 and chapter 2. And I guess we'll go through the whole thing like um, two chapters per day. Um, so we'll be done sometime next week before we move on into Orb Scepter Throne. Which I think I remember more of. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but anyway, let's get started and talk a bit about Stone Wielder, shall we? Well, that was disappointing. Anyways, cheers. <laughs> So, let's get the basics out of the way. We're talking about that continent that hasn't shown up at all before. There's like two continents that we haven't seen anywhere before in the um, either books of the Malazan Empire or novels of the Malazan Empire, other books, Malazan Book of the Fallen or Path to Ascendancy or novels of the Malazan Empire. I assume we haven't seen it in Carcanus, but who knows about <laughs> geography in Carcanus, right? Anyways. What I mean is, we're talking about um, Fist or Corral. Um, because the other one that we haven't seen yet is Assail, I assume. <laughs> Although it kind of was hinted at in Return of the Crimson Guard already. We have been shortly to Jakaruku. Um, and obviously, uh, Leather and, you know, Genebakis and. Uh, Quantali and so forth. We know fairly well by now. We've always heard about Corel and the Stormwall. All right, we heard about Storm uh, in that short bit in Return of the Crimson Guard when Corel and Stormwall was introduced with um, Eriko and Traveler for a moment. I kind of forgot that. See, <laughs> that's how fuzzy my brain is. <clears throat> But now we're actually dealing with the entire continent, and we'll see how things are going on there. We'll have a few look backs. We'll have a few looks at other parts of the world, um, but very few. Um, we're going to go into that, like in a second, as well. So, what do we have here? Um, we have something that shows up in the beginning of the book, in the in the prologue, that moves in. And this is something that I really appreciated about the way um, this prologue was uh, is handled. We do something that we have like seen before in um, you know Ericsson do in uh, say Memories of Ice, um, also technically in Return of the Crimson Guard. Um, Asselmont did something else similar, which is we start out in the way, 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 way olden times, wherever that may be. Like, however far back that may be. <clears throat> and we then, and this is something new, I feel, and I don't know, I've said that before, but I feel like Cam Asselmont's novels are a lot more cinematic in the way they are written a lot easier to adapt or turn into like a movie script, I feel. And this is once again something like that. Because what we see here is um, first a scene like in the way, 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 way back times when something that we, that I assume is the crippled god falls into, down to earth. So we 
or have that connection to the overall Malazan thing of the crippled god falling down and, you know, doing all the things that fallen gods uh, do later on and so forth. Then we jump on and have a first one from jump forward in time, a large jump when we have um, people on the Isles uh, or Fist or Corel somewhere on that coast where we have a short scene about the goddess showing up, whoever the Blessed Lady will be, um, and giving those younger invaders that are fighting um, for their lives against the Storm Riders, who have, at this point, already shown up, who gives them um, her blessing and some magical item or power to withstand them and to build the Storm Wall. That's our next scene. It's a short one, once again, but we're closer to our actual time, so we're zooming forward in time. The next one is um, when we are even closer to where we need to be. That is, the Malazan occupation of Fist Corel has already begun. But um, we're not yet at where we are, like, at the now of the narrative. Uh, where we have a scene about a well, assessor who seems to be half um, investigator, half judge, or whatever in that world, coming across a maybe mystical, mythical, uh, like, well, not myst mythical, or maybe uh, um, religious or whatever strange killing of a girl or a young woman, we don't know, um, with, like, connotations to that. And there we already see, um, we're even closer to the now with this one. And it's something that will show up later again, obviously. And then we come to the now where we meet some of our um, characters that we've seen before in the um, in Return of the Crimson Guard, when we come to the now and check in with our buddy Kyle and um, Greymane. Something like that. So, um, that's sort of what I want to say, like, as a cinematic or even, yeah, introduction to a book. We, we start in the far back with the first and primal cause of what will happen later, because we've known from other parts of the Malazan writings that the co the continent or subcontinent of Fist and Corel um, was torn apart by these... Um, by stuff uh, was torn down when uh, was torn apart when the crippled god was torn down to earth. So that's uh, drawn down to earth. So that's sort of where we see where the continent, the the place we will be in, um, is established in the way that it is now. That's our first scene. Then we jump in one further, and we have that conflict of invaders that well, they are invaders from outside that take over the come to these islands, fight the already, in like the inhabitants we all had already have there, and then have that get that strange deal um, with that goddess, whatever she may be, to, to build the storm wall, to defend the land, and so forth. So after having established the geography, we now establish the basis of society in that world that we we'll, we we'll live in. And one of the first like man-made features, and one of the major features, like um, architectural features and general features that of that place that we we'll live in, that being the storm wall with all that comes from that, and the faith to um, the goddess known as the Blessed Lady. So we jump that part, and then we come to the now, or like where the now is established, that being <clears throat> a society of original natives, um, then come conquerors, who are now also conquered and occupied by the Malazans. With all the tensions you have between original inhabitants, Malazans, and um, those former occupiers now also occupied in between with something going on there in the undercurrent of society where the like actual conflict is already established and we have our first um, inklings of the plot that will unfold there. So that's 
that's how he does it. And then we zoom in to have that reconnection with characters that we have met before in our previous book. Um, in the now, when we see basically where we will be for most of the novel, what will be the place we are going to, and then we'll see who will be going there. That being Greymane, which, you know, kind of makes sense, because we've heard before that he's called Stonewielder, like the novel. So, as I said, this is like, as an opening for a novel, it is a very much, like, almost cinematic one in the way that these individual scenes are set when we come from that far, far back and then move closer and closer and closer to that relatively small, narrow focus with the co like that call back to those characters that we have um, known before. Which is done all really well. Now, I know a lot of people say that Stonewielder is the novel where Cam Esselmont really finds his voice. And we're going to talk about that later on while talking about this book. But I can certainly understand that the way he handles it this time around here, with a, once again, tighter focus, um, makes it easier to appreciate this novel compared to Return of the Crimson Guard, which, as we spoke about, is a rather sprawling and... Um, so forth, because it tries to tie so many different elements, aspects, and well, not even plot lines, like parts of plot lines together, in a way. So um, I can understand that. And one, as I said, like this, this prologue is just one of the best handled ones when it comes to setting a stage for a for a plot later on for the, for the novel. That's just like done extremely well. So, where do we go from here? Well, in the first two chapters that I've also read today, we obviously have then, like, the, um, well, opening moves in what will become the overall plot. We have check back with a couple of um, characters that we've known before. We see Kiska, who is now starting to search for um, uh, Tej Ren. We have Kyle and Greymane who are doing uh, Kyle and Greymane things. We have um, Captain Fist, whatever, Rillish, who is called back to duty. Um, we have a couple of new characters, one of them being Bakun, the um, assessor. Then we have obviously the Stormwall that we have also seen, and we um, there we also meet back again with everyone's favorite, <laughs> not at home, Crimson Guard fan, <laughs> that being Iron Bars. So we see he's now um, <laughs> there as the overall champion of the wall. Um, that's sort of where we have all these, you know, what you do with one of those large novels. You kind of establish all these different... Um, characters, viewpoint characters, and given first, like, look at how things are in Corel or in those islands. And things are not well. Not well at all. And, I mean, that comes as no surprise, because obviously we want some kind of tensions going on there, right? Um, and Aslan does this in the usual way that we've come to establish and to expect from uh, Malazan novels, that being a lot of the conflicts there are cultural and rooted in history. Um, this time around, a lot of that is like two main conflicts that are obviously con connected one to the other. The first one is the whole um, colonialism, or in this case, like occupation. We have to understand that like the occupation of Corel is a much different affair from the... Uh, Malaz and conquest and occupation of Sage and Abacus, and even probably of um, Seven Cities, in a way. And the other one is a religious one. As I said, those are connected. Because Corel has been um, an occupied land all the time. We have those original inhabitants who are called, like, you know, well, tribesmen or whatever, who have lived there before. We have the conquerors who took over that country, who are the now sort of official, like, like the people that most people think of when they talk about Corelry. Um, and then 
we have the Malazan conquerors who are occupying the whole thing now. Um, and unlike, say, in other parts of the empire where conquest leads to, you know, building up of um, cultural, of culture, um, uh, a destruction of local um, hierarchies, um, like a building up of a functioning bureaucracy, and so forth, that leads overall to a, um, you know, rise in wealth and whatnot um, in, like we see, like like the original plans of the Malazan Empire were, which made them so successful. Um, this time around, we see the very, very dark side of it. We see corruption. There's a lot of corruption going on there. We have hatred of everyone against everyone, basically, and... Over all of that, we have a tyrannical faith um, of the, you know, Our Blessed Lady, which ha is one of the first times we have, like, a really, like, more detailed examination of religion in the Malazan world, in the novels, um, and the book, and the path, and all of that. So I do appreciate that, and we'll be talking about religion a good deal more over time here. Um... But what we see here is that this place, the entire like subcontinent of Fist, is basically one step away from collapse. And that is... Well, it's difficult to say who's to blame for that. It's certainly the Malazan's fault, but it's also like the old Corelli's fault. And uh, all of this. Behind that, we have that outside threat, that being the Storm Riders. One that we have seen before in Night of Knives, of course. Um, so, um, yeah, that's sort of the board that is set for us. We once again have, um, like, individual plot lines that we'll, um, we will see how they, because what we have here, once again, is something that feels familiar. And that's That, I feel, is the strength of Cam Esselmond's writing compared to... Um, Stephen Erickson's writing, Cam Esselmont is a bit more um, open or direct when it comes to using specific tropes or plot lines that we have seen before in fantasy and then twisting them and subverting them. Um, he's cleaving closer to the... Um, well, the classics are fantasy in a way, or like these, th these kind of things. And... Um, well, we'll see where this will all go in now. I mean, you have the whole idea of the wall, the Storm Riders, the wall that the Storm Riders are attacking. Now, obviously, cynics um, uh, will say that, yes, we have that kind of wall already. We have something similar in the... Um, <laughs> in George R. Martin's World of Ice and Fire. Um, now, obviously, there's, I, I assume that the Storm Wall and that idea was created way before... Um, in the 80s, before George R. Martin wrote his novels, so there's certainly no, um, um, you know, you can't blame anyone for stealing from anyone else. Um, but there are certain parallels, obviously, you have the this defense that is against some outlying outside threat, and over time, because of security, that feeling of security, or the, you know, the yeah, most of that feeling of security and support for that defense has kind of waned. So while the Chosen Ones and the Night Watch in uh, Martin's like cannot really be compared by himself, we certainly see similar patterns there. Um, in a way, we certainly see um, yeah similar patterns, and I guess it's very difficult now that both pieces of media have been out there for a while to not you know, to not subconsciously at least compare those two. I'm not going to judging here. I'm just saying that the idea of having that kind of defense, that kind of defense being crumbling and falling apart because the former glory of whatever it was, that, that guard against that outside supernatural threat has fallen, that whole thing has fallen into disrepair um, and, well, not disrepute, but, it, like, has lost its former glory, while those actually doing the job are well aware of the, um, well, 
of the threat they're at, they're fighting against and are fighting a losing battle there. Um, that's something that those two have in common. Now, from there on, we obviously have different aspects, and we'll talk about that later on when we continue through the novel. Um, but it's certainly something that we have seen before, and that we will, you know, there's obviously like even within say um what's it um we have a similar thing when we look at the history of middle earth it's just one of those things that we in general history as humans i guess have come to um, think about that once we are not constantly facing a specific threat um we tend to forget it and think about other things and look at other things so that's that's once again like a classic that we have seen before then we have the um um, the noir part almost. I want to, don't want to call it noir or hard-boiled or anything like that yet because the, the language style is obviously a different one and that one is part of those genres but um, Inspector, not what Inspector, <laughs> Assessor Bakun's um, attempts to solve a crime against, uh, that, that no one wants to be solved um, and the way this is written is certainly a, takes pages out of the books of like crime novels and I'm really interested to see how that is continuing because that's something that we haven't seen much of in the Malazan world so far. There's only, you know, that guardsman <clears throat> in Toll the Hounds that is trying to solve the mysteries of those killings there. But the language, the whole way this is set up is a very different one from... I always want to call him Inspector now, which is stupid. Uh, Assessor Bakun's storyline. Which leads us to the religion there. Of course, we've already seen that. Um, we have more discussion on religion with Ipshank. Um, and the other guy, whose name I have forgotten again. Manask? I think Manask. Um, names we have heard before, but now we actually meet the person who is a priest. Possibly a priest of the Cripple God. But we don't know exactly. There's like just hints of him being a priest of a new god, even though he used to be a priest of Fainer, who is newly fallen, or so we hear, which, you know, helps us once again to um, put this into, you know, context. I mean, we kind of know it's the first year of Emperor Malik's um, reign. And one thing that I really liked about the <laughs> already now is like every time Malik shows up somewhere or is mentioned somewhere, people hate him and he has like a different epithet. Once he's Emperor Malik the Generous, then he's Emperor Malik the Glorious Emperor. The I like that because it kind of harkens back to that um, end of Crimson Guard, Return of the Crimson Guard, when. Um, um, the mages are discussing all the terrible um, possible the uh, stupid nicknames he will like epithets he will find for himself so having that pick up again helps to you know make connections within the overall thing so <clears throat> What do we see here in this book that we can take away that we haven't, I mean, have seen partly before and see as a general aspect of the Malazan world when it comes to religion? Now, we have seen before in Khartoum with the direct worship, the way it was handled there. And what we can see here is that within the Malazan world, worldly power, uh, it, it, it should be like, not it should be, well, so here's the thing. Every time a strict secularism is not observed and religion and and actual worldly power are mixed, it leads to all kinds of problems. As I said, we see this in Khartoum with um, how um, the cult there is ruling the place with all the sacrifices and whatnot, what we see in mostly Dead House Landing. Well, that's sort of mostly where we see it. And now here we see it much more. Because we have that connection. That is, and this is this is the very, very perfidious thing here, right? We have we have a state religion, that being the state religion of the Blessed Lady, the goddess that protects the land against the storm riders. But it is also a very specific ethnic religion. It is very much connected to those first invaders of Corel, the group um, of Timul and his 
gang or wherever they came from that we meet in the second part of the prologue and who are the original, well not the original, but the um, ruling Corelry, like people, the ruling people in Corel before the Malazans show up. It is ethnically connected to them. It's their goddess, not the gods or goddesses or whatever you want to call them, powers maybe, that the original inhabitants, the um, indigenous population of uh, Fist worshipped. It's also definitely not the uh, the the goddess of the occupying Malazans, so it is both a religious thing and an ethnic thing. It helps to define a an ethnic identity as well as a religious identity, which is a very, very dangerous thing when you look at our world and how that works in different parts of our world, if you want to think about it that way. Now, um... What else is important there? Um, that worship of that particular goddess is, at least for its adherents, directly, directly connected with the safety of the actual land. Because you remember the first, you know, that second part of the prologue. What we see there is exactly that: that she, that goddess, whoever she may be, promises to protect the land against the storm riders. And if that protection fails, well. Bad things will happen, and lots of them. <laughs> so, that's an interesting setup there. At the same time, we figure out that a religion here, like that, that religion is something intuitive. And we have that conversation with Ipshank when he talks about it to, I've forgotten the name of the girl that we'll probably see more of later on. <clears throat> we have new cults coming, we have Ipshan coming, we have the priestess, who I've not yet identified if I've met her before, because my brain and whatnot, you know, who is a priestess of Decembre, the cult of, well, well, Decembre, the Lord of Tears, um, well, and Dasim Altor. So we see new cults showing up that um, are very attractive to... Um, the disenfranchised. This is once again the thing what we see here with those people. Their adherents are either people of the, you know, of the indigenous population or otherwise disenfranchised people um, that find those cults and swell those cults, which is something that once again we have seen before when the religions in our world find adherents. They usually, new faiths, find adherents with the disenfranchised um, uh, society. Not with those already um, in privileged um, circumstances, or sometimes well with the actual elite that has time, that had time to develop some sort of cynicism towards religious uh, matters. A, <clears throat> so that's sort of what we see here showing up with the cult of Decembre and possibly also Ipshank's cult later on. And we see the harsh reaction of the church there, which leads to, well, pogroms, basically, against everyone, like, and anyone. We have one of those in, like, stark detail in um, um, the plot line with, is it named Ivana? I think it's Ivana, or that guy, the half Tarthanel, um, who wanted to be a farmer. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about that in a second as well but we have when he comes to that village and we have that mad priest and the whole like complete deconstruct like destruction or self-destruction of social structure through violence that we see there is a very very dark look at how human nature uh human gullibility and human um yeah <clears throat> Human nature basically can lead to self-destruction. This is not a book that has a overall positive picture of humanity. <laughs> or people, I guess, is what we want to call them here, once again. Um, so we have that here. But let's talk about Ivana for a second. So he's the former cha cha champion who walked away to live a farm life and no longer kill. And now, through all these things, he's forced back into... Um, you know, taking a stand in some way or another. We'll see where all of that leads in the future. Well, once again, this is a this this is almost like an archetype. I do remember it from the samurai movies. I'm pretty sure 
There's other, like, media where we have the same thing, I guess, in Westerns, I assume. Like, I just can't name any of them right now, but the idea of that retired fighter who is against his will forced to take to come back and do his dirty deeds and become a warrior again. I mean, technically you see that in Red Country by Joe Abercrombie, for example, in a novel. As I said, it's an archetype, especially from not, like you know, from media, like from genres like the Western and possibly the samurai uh, story or movie as well. <clears throat> and it's obviously significant that he takes up farming, which is technically the opposite of what he does before. It's like instead of killing and destroying life as a farmer, he creates life and nurtures life. And now he's forced to go back to what he probably knows best against his will and through... Um, no wish of himself, but the outside world, who doesn't know what it's got coming, now he do, uh, now it does that really stupid thing. <laughs> and, well, in a way, we have the same thing going on with Kyle and um, Greymane, especially with Greymane, who was also forced back into the fray against his will, relish the same through Emperor Malik at this point. But we haven't really a faint, the faintest idea what's going on there by now, uh, so far. We'll talk about that, I guess, tomorrow. But everyone seems to be called back to um, Corel and uh, the Stormwall and all the things that are going on there. One of them is Rayman, who is forced to basically face up to a past that he had tried to walk away from, from unfinished business, or maybe doing better, we see him at the beginning obviously being haunted by the past and his, you know, failures when he is um, um, <laughs> drunk, depressed and whatnot. At the same time we see Kyle who is sort of our, like, well, we remember like the chosen one from the last time and also someone who comes from outside of civilization uh, to witness the negative sides of civilization specifically um, the use of money crime capitalism that kind of thing and how unnecessary it seems to him so there's some criticism going on there that we've seen before and we'll see again um, I guess we can say that neither Steven Erickson nor um, Cam Esselmont are extreme fans of overt extremes of capitalism and all the negative sides that can bring with itself, greed and whatnot, and, you know, money-based crime. <clears throat> but that's just like, you know, all set up with like a cool, few cool action scenes, we uh, see that all lead to origin, some are grey main to go back to well, Corral and Fist. Um, so we have at this point sort of where we see all our major players being drawn in there. We have the crew on the stone wall storm wall that is facing the direst um year yet because of lacking support from the countries and from the people they are supposed and sworn to protect. There's obviously internal problems there as well that we'll see in the near future. We have the looming threat that will be there with that short interval when we talk about the, the freezing and that the storm wall is not as strong as it may be because there is a chance that the frost and the extreme cold will actually break the storm wall apart. Um, so there's like natural, supernatural, and political threats to the storm wall with that looming threat of annihilation of everyone living in that part of the world. Um, we have a maybe conspiracy connected in some odd way to the um, to that religious cult. We have all these social tensions building there due to mismanagement in an occupation, well, in two occupations, really. And we have our main focuses, our criminal investigator, our um, um, pacifist for forced to return to a warlike demeanor, our warrior who's trying to right an old wrong or to, you know, get his, um, you know, 
peace of mind and some other people that are sort of drawn in around that in all kinds of places and will all draw in to that major conflict in the near future, I assume. There was something more I wanted to talk about, but I just can't remember what it was. All oh, right, I remember now. A, one of those small philosophical debates. The idea of what absolute evil is, and that absolute evil may just be waste and inaction on not doing something. Because, yes, you can always judge, like, evil, like, relative evil, about, like, when you weigh positive and negative consequences of an action. But not acting at all is uh, deemed, at least in that conversation, that we never, like, fully, you know... It's just one of those small tidbits in there. Um, um, yeah. Inaction, lack of action, is seen as the absolute evil because you, you know, do, like, everything from the start. That's an interesting concept we'll probably explore further in the future. Another one that is interesting is Ipshank's conversation about the true faith comes from inside. It's intuitive and comes from inside and the form it takes is incidental to that. And that's something that I have strong opinions on and I'll probably come back to that as well later um, in further videos. So we'll talk about that again, I promise. Uh, but for now, I feel I've like kind of said enough I think this is definitely a very strong opening for a novel. Um, it has a tighter focus than Return of the Crimson Guard. It has a very much like darker undertone already. That whole feeling of decay, of dissolution, is very, very strong in this one already. And um, we'll see where all of this will go when we talk about chapters 3 and 4 tomorrow. So until then... Have a great Tuesday, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Cheers.